Okay, I'm trying to gonna try to one shot this. I was asked to do a sort of video on how this SRAM dump works. Um, system resource usage monitor SRAM is basically the task manager or the the system resource monitor for Windows, but it keeps the history in a DAT file. So there's a tool Mark Bagger created called SRAM dump, and this PowerShell script, which I'll include in the notes. We'll tell you, show you exactly how to run it. So essentially this PowerShell script does it for you. It's actually, this script is specifically designed for CrowdStrike, but you can run it just on the local host, just like you would normally. So what it does is it goes and downloads this executable from GitHub for Mark Baggett. And once it does that, it pulls down the template that it's used to interpolate the data from the, the as from that file and once that's done it runs as from and it used references the current windows normal path for the dat file and it uses the current template that we just downloaded and exports sets results to ftep temp folder so once you're done you can actually download this uh, windows temp ftech as from dump output so what that looks like and i'll show you here in a second will show you lots of things. Forensically, it's been used to correlate people's location based on wireless access points they connect to, etc. But what I'll say is usually for our cases, we're going to use it for application resource usage. So in here we have a list of going back, way back and in, in far as far as dates go, the, the times when these processes were run, we can go pretty far back in time. We got 3332. Of course, it currently is 32 today. But, anyways, 1 1. So, this goes back all the way to 1 1. This specific process, I have no idea what it is, but it might be causing uh, process issues because as it goes, it's the number one uh, outside of Chrome, the number one process being used for this service, for this workstation. Other things, like I said, it's got network connectivity usage to process usage, so application usage, battery usage, things like that. But for this case, we're going to use the application resource usage and do a pivot table and show us uh, we're going to add the CPU time background and CPU time foreground. I actually don't know what any of these are really. I just made some guesses. But there's bytes read, bytes written. You might want to go by. There's read operations, background, bytes, here's some other stuff. But I just did foreground plus background, so simple function where you do equals and then say CPU time foreground and then the plus sign, CPU, CPU time background. So now we have this plus this value equals this value here. And once we finish that, we have a row here that shows the foreground and the background combined for each row. Then you make a pivot table, which if you don't know how to do that, we can do that real quick. Say insert pivot table. And we're gonna, this is a pretty big document. So we're gonna do application and then we're gonna do our added sum of foreground and background. You can change the pivot table options to not resize the width of the table so that you're not, eyes aren't bleeding. Then you can sort this by size largest to smallest, or largest to smallest. And now we see that Chrome's number one, whatever this is, number two, these are n normal somewhat. Teams is a hog. This is Outlook. Uh, but you can get start to see a paint a picture of what is being using up what percentages of process. And that should help with that. The next thing, actually, firstly, I would do before any of that, I would actually use a program called Auto Runs. And this will run this as the system user and you also want to run it as the normal user because the normal user might start up processes that can cause problems so you want to run it as both users and as the normal user non non-administrator user you can just uncheck everything and disable everything um, but you might not have access to read and write these paths but this essentially tells you what starts when the computer starts what we can do is go up here fairly quickly and go to hide microsoft entries 
and it will hide anything that's basically Microsoft. Any of this yellow stuff is just stuff that doesn't exist. So for example, this Adobe Type Manager, this doesn't even exist on the system. So it's not really an issue. Some other things I would look for is, for example, this guy, you know, not verified. It'll do like a verification check. And you can also submit, submit some files to virus total to check and see if it's you know, got a common signature. But essentially anything in here in the run key, uh, anything in run startup uh, system, services this kind of tells you what's actually running when the computer starts so like for example these these two guys uh, i wouldn't have these running even though they're not even in here um so i looks like i've disabled some of these the force force point endpoint stuff it's like uh, some other stuff in here so this is where you can get an idea for how much actual stuff is running when the computer starts and so for example i can right click this and say submit virus total there usually is a license acceptance for that. But anyways, we'll let that sit in the background. Oh, it says error, but they get to have a key probably by now. So that's auto runs. I would do that first. Next, I would do something called System Internal Process Monitor, where you can actually dump every file, every registry key, every network access. If you can do a point in time assessment and reproduce the issue, this is going to be your best bet. It's going to give you basically the best possible a largest amount of data, network and registry and disk and everything Windows in one's place. So if you can capture that issue in a short time span, be it five minutes, then this is your best bet to run Process Explorer, export the results and have someone else look at it for you. Next thing I would honestly run, and, and this is just depends on how aggressive you want to be, but this is a fairly aggressive script that will go in and run the Windows Clean Manager first, which is a standard tool, pretty safe to run. It's just, it'll clean up old updates, anything like that, get rid of space, clean up space. This will remove um, all the user's temp files so are for basically normal programs. This is very limited. And essentially, it will clear out history, temp files, uh, temporary internet files for Chrome, Chrome bookmarks, or sorry, Edge bookmarks, Edge recent temporary internet files for Chrome, but this is not so much useful anymore. The real meat of this is BleachBit, which is kind of discontinued, but it's still a very powerful tool. BleachBit basically is CCleaner, if you've ever run that before, but it's a command line way of doing it. And this will essentially download BleachBit, run the cleaner, enable all the options, and clean up everything that it can possibly clean up. Um, here's some other additional stuff where it's like shell menus and disabling thumbnail cache and tray icons. But the meat of this is the bleach bit and also the, I think this might be quick kill. Yeah, the quick kill also runs with this too. So quick kill script will essentially download a bat file from the internet. You can look at the source yourself, but it'll download the bat file from the internet and it will essentially kill every task that's not essential for Windows to be running. And this works for Windows 10. I've tested it on probably 30 machines. And this is what you want to run before you run any kind of cleaner, because for Windows, if you're actively running an executable, you're not going to be able to delete whatever you're trying to delete. So if you're trying to clean up files or clean stuff up and there's something running, be it malware, adware, spyware, whatever you want to crapware, whatever you want to call it, quick kill will essentially kill everything so you can have a clean slate as, as much as you can, barring that there's not some weird like ring zero hook or something crazy malware running. And it will try to kill everything and give you a clean clean state without rebooting and safe mode networking or whatever. And then allow you to run those cleaners and unlock some of those files that would be normally locked when you're trying to clean up temp stuff. The next thing I would say is kind of a, a Hail Mary. This is a Tron script, which has been around forever. It's basically IT in a box. It runs CCleaner, it runs AV, it runs all kinds of things. It runs debloats. It basically is an IT in a box. So when you run this script, it can take anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours, depending on the system. So if you've never run it before, it might take a while. Um, there's options you can run to disable the virus check if you don't want to run that, but if you're going to run it, you might as well 
let it run. But this is basically IT in a box. If you don't have time to work with the user and they're just complaining that their computer is slow, run Transcript, walk away, come back two hours later, reboot, run it again. If it doesn't find anything, you're good to go. Um, so with these kind of pieces, that's where I would start as far as like CPU usage. There's some other resources around uh, SRAM uh, that's usually primarily used. Nobody actually knows about it, except for forensics people. It's primarily used for forensics folks to gather artifacts on systems that don't have any EDR or anything like that. So you get application resource, energy usage, energy usage long-term, network connections, network usage, push notification data. So if like something pops up in the sys tray, you got some malware or something. So that's some pretty rich information and not a lot of people know about it. So that's why I wanted to do a, a short video on kind of how to use it and how I would approach someone's computer running slow or whatever it is. That's pretty much it and good luck.